Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if Deku became a hero through science part 2. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 3rd comment down below and let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and also share this video with your friends and check out the description in my playlist so let's start the video. Okay, people and animals. I'm sure you all know why I've called you here today. Egon stated while slapping a table in a meeting room that everyone was sitting around. It's your birthday. Izuku guessed. No, Egon replied. It's Christmas. Otto guessed. No, Egon replied more firmly. It's the anniversary of your vasectomy. Pluck asked in a teasing tone. Are you serious? Egon irritatedly asked. You called us here to tone down the crazy things we're making and doing to get the desired results. Izuku guessed while fiddling with his fingers, making everyone tense up. No, but that is a good point. So long as you guys aren't doing anything illegal or immoral, it won't turn into an end of the world scenario. I don't see any harm in letting you guys do what you want to do. He told them, making everyone sigh before he slapped the table again and exclaimed, No, why I called you here is about our team or rather dot 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 lack of it. We need to hire more people at SAP. We also need an organizer, receptionist, and secretary just for you. I'm sure you're just chopping at the bit to do some of what we're doing. Pluck counters her off on her feathers in a tempting tone. Egon sighed while rubbing his sore neck and saying, can't argue with that, but we do need more heads. We have many avenues to cover and only three minds to work with. And I can safely say after a lot of the things that we've made so far, and we're able to sell, we are far more financially stable enough to have more employees. Otto clapped his tentacles and proclaimed, Wonderful. Then let's set up some lectures at different universities and see who becomes interested. After all, what we do here would seem completely bogus to the unwise. So it's perfect to weed out the weak. I'm in complete agreement with you, Professor. But I'll need you and the doctor to step out of this one. Egon tells the two animals who look at him incredulously. Izuku and I will take the lead on that. He stated firmly. What? Why? Pluck argues back. The world isn't going to magically be okay with talking animals overnight. It might cause an uproar or something worse. Izuku tells them in a fake musical tone, while wiggling his fingers. What about that Nezu fella? He's a talking animal that's known to the public. Otto argues with a raised eyebrow ridge. Principal Nezu is a whole different kin of worms, Izuku tells him, and one we don't have the time to get into. Egon adds firmly, seeing their unpleasant expressions at them. Egon sighs and offers, look, we'll be the ones going to just about every university in Japan while you two will stay here and look up any potential employees and set up interviews. The two animals think about this for a while until Otto finally relents and says in agreement, well that is better than trekking around in the hot sun all day. Pluck just shrugs with her co-worker, also not wanting to walk all over the country. Egon nods in approval while saying in an exhausted tone. Good to hear, now let's set everything up and get to it. I seriously need a break. Many failed university lectures later. Egon stops his way out of the emergency exit of a university auditorium. His face was red with a mix of anger and embarrassment as he practically foamed at the mouth. Running behind him was Izuku with a huge stack of things in his arms. All things are used as demonstrations and charts and graphs for lectures. That was the 20th auditorium we were laughed out of. Is it me? Is it you? Is what we're doing really that unbelievable? Egon lamented. From a third-person perspective dot 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 it kinda does. But at least this one apologized and gave us our money back for wasting our time. Izuku admitted while taking all the objects down and counting a stack of cash he pulled from his pocket. We've been to every university and college in Japan and not one promising person or a smig of interest from all those two dollars. Half brain, money wasting, idiotic leches. This is hopeless. Egon yelled while dropping to his knees and yelling into the sky. Izuku rubbed his cheek and offered, maybe we should have brought the professor or doctor with us. Nothing tells the truth like hyper-intelligent talking animals. Maybe. Egon admitted while his face was flat on the ground. Also we still have one more college. Maybe this one will be a winner. Izuku tried to assure him in a chipper tone. Egon sighs deeply then laments while giving in. Then let's get it over with so I can go cry into a tub of ice cream and fried chicken. Later, Egon stood before a now empty auditorium with an expression that could only be referred to as contained anguish. Besides him was Izuku who felt like a clown for suggesting one more. After calming down a bit his eye twitched and he broke his pointing stick in frustration. After getting that out of his system he stated, well, I guess that's it. What a piss up. It could have been worse. Izuku tried to offer. Egon groaned and told him, thank you for the optimism, Izuku, but it's not appreciated at the moment. After wiping his hands across his face and making a painful sound he began to pack his belongings while saying, Let's go back so I can put myself into a food-based hangover. What happens if you infuse the two polarities together? 
Also, what would happen if you turned the frequency into a baseline instead of positive or negative? Would sound waves have any effect on this? Asked a voice that sounded close to Egon. Thinking it was the boy, Egon repressed the urge to growl and told him, Izuku I'd love nothing more than to trade theories with you but right now I'm. That wasn't me. Izuku cut him off swiftly. Egon shit up after hearing this and looked into the empty auditorium one last time. He looked closely, narrowing his eyes and putting a hand over them to see better. After scanning the area he finally came up on one single person left sitting in the now empty hall. Professor Egon, did you hear me? The person asked aloud. Going over to his assistant, Egon mouthed to him, I think we found a winner. After this, Egon and Izuku invited the only person left to an impromptu interview outside the college's building. There they sat on benches looking across from one another on a stone table. The person left was a man in his late 30 seconds wearing typical college attire. He was evenly tanned with blue eyes and a mild build with a height of just under 5'3". His face was angular and his eyes were tired. On his head was not hair but five tube-like attachments that seemed to move on their own accord. Four of the five were very snake-like but had no features apart from a mouth in which the teeth were made into the lips as opposed to being covered by them. The fifth one was like a tail. Thanks to Izuku, they were able to get a huge chunk of his background for this interview. Thanks to this, Izuku was given the chance to do the interview. After looking it over briefly, Izuku asked him, So Mr. Hankai Osuru, am I saying that correctly? The man nodded. Well Mr. Hankai, I do like what I see so far, though I have a few questions for you, if that's alright. Once again he nods. After flipping a page, Izuku inquired, I can't help but notice two things. First off you are well into your late 30 seconds and attending college. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Education should never be based on age, only those willing to learn. And also it says here that you have over a dozen years in the music industry as a singer and performer. What compelled you to take such a drastic shift in career choices? Hankayo blows out the air in a stressed manner before explaining, Where do I start? Well, I'm sure you have no idea who I am, but back when I was a singer I used to go by the name of Five Chord Gus. Oh, I think I've heard of you. You're from Europe if I'm not mistaken. I know because I heard your rendition of Omeo Babino Caro by Puccini if I'm not mistaken. Egon cuts in with recognition. That's me. I used to sing a lot of songs back in my day. Hankayo confirmed as he continued, as for why I choose to pursue a different career choice, especially at this stage of my life. Well I'm sure you know but I'll tell you everything anyway I want to be completely transparent with you since you're considering hiring me. The two of them look at one another, nod and Izuku prompts him to continue. After a bit of internal conflict, Hankayo admits, ever since I was young, my quirk 5 living chords gave me full control, range, and frequency of my vocals. I was a natural prodigy at singing. And my parents dot 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 my parents used this, from the time it manifested to the point my career ended. My parents used my talent to make bank. Every day was always about how I can improve and how I can get even bigger, he said in an irritated and disgusted tone. After breathing to calm himself he continues saying, Anyway, as you can guess, there was a lot of undue stress on a developing child and my mind was hanging on by a thread for my whole life until I finally snapped. I am not proud of it but I killed a lot of people on my very last performance day. Several people in the crowd, a few security guards, my manager, and my parents. He stops with a shaky breath and wipes away a stray tear. After calming down enough to speak correctly, he tells them none of those people deserve to die, except for my parents and my manager. I'll never deny my feelings on that. He proclaimed boldly, making the two men across from him sweat drop. Hankayo coughs and continues with an apology, sorry. Anyhow, I don't remember a lot of what happened after that, but I managed to get out of any legal trouble by settling outside of court. When my head cleared a bit, I had a recollection of what I did and checked myself into a mental ward. I got out in a year and had to spend the next few figuring out myself. My entire life my world revolved around my talent for singing and nothing else. I had to do what most kids have their whole lives to do. That's when I realized I had a knack for discovery and knowledge but didn't like going outside. So I decided to become a researcher and enrolled in this university. He takes another shaky breath, hugging himself to calm down before babbling. But I'll be honest, my only two regrets in life were killing all those people during my breakdown and never helping my two older siblings. They were always shunned by my parents and I was favored up until the oldest turned 18 and moved out with the middle, and I never saw them again. I hope they are happier now than when they were with my parents. God I miss them so much, I wish I could apologize to them. Hankayo realized what he was saying and doing. He retracts while apologetically stating, I'm sorry, I'm rambling. Izuku waves it off and tells him, No no no, you needed to get that off your chest. Though if I may, why come to Japan? Izuku inquired. Hankayo shrugs and tells him, Just needed to get away from. Everything. A fresh start, you know. Izuku nods, looks to Egon, then back to Hankayo while asking, Uh, could you give us the room? 
Hankayo nods and walks off to a different spot, allowing the two men to speak in semi-privacy. From there, Izuku stands and asks his superior, Professor, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Yes, he exclaimed. So you think we should give this guy a chance and hire him? He asked to make sure. But Egon disappointed him as he admitted. I was thinking we should stop by my favorite American restaurant and get some of their new cheese fries. But let's do your thing first. Izuku gives him a half-lidded stare while Egon shoots back. What? I'm hungry. Izuku shakes his head and walks back over to the man who was now making a flower crown. Mr. Hankayo. Izuku started, making the man stand up. The team then stuck out his hand and said with a smile, Welcome aboard. Once you've graduated, you have a job waiting for you in the Neo Icon Phoenix Research Facility. Hankayo's face lit up like a Christmas tree and he exclaimed in an excited voice while shaking his hand hard and fast. Oh thank you. Thank you so much. I'll do my best to make you both proud. You won't regret this. Making the boy and his head tendrils shake like crazy. Seeing that Izuku was stuck, Egon broke it up by saying, Don't thank us yet. You'll also be having the pleasure of running your division. Hankayo stopped shaking and clutching a nearby tree he asked back, looking ready to pass out. My dot 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 my division. It can be anything you want. Egon tells him. Well then, Hankayo thinks for a minute before offering. How about the sound division? The two men look at one another, shrug, and Egon says, if that's what you want. After many thanks and handshakes goodbye, Izuku and Egon begin to walk away from the college. And once they're seemingly far enough away, Egon turns to Izuku and asks, should we be worried that the guy who has music-based PTSD wants to make an entire research division solely to the study of sound? Let's put a pin in it for now. Izuku tells him with equal concern. To which Izuku asks, should we have told him about his other co-workers? Egon thinks about it, mentally rejects it, and replies, let's cross that bridge when we get to it. Speaking of which, I wonder how they did on their manhunt. Later at Neo Icon Phoenix Research Lab, you found and set up how many? Egon exclaimed in shock as he looked over his two animal employees. Six in total. That includes your assistant, secretary, and organizer. Professor Cephalopod answered while adding sugar to his coffee in the coffee cart. As Egon stands in shock, Izuku does quick math and corrects him, your math is off. It would be eight, not six. You'll see what I mean at the interviews. Professor Cephalopod says vaguely with a knowing look, making Izuku more concerned than curious. So how did your search go? Dr. Orpington asked while pecking at a loaf of bread. Like shit. Egon groaned while rolling his eyes. We did find one. Izuku corrects him. Wow. Professor Cephalopod resists the urge to chuckle, while Dr. Orpington holds no bars back and clucks out loud in laughter. Hey, don't laugh. We were kicked, laughed at, and chased out by so many of those uptight universities. We were lucky to get just one. Egon sants at the two creatures. After sighing in frustration he states, Anyhow, let's just hope that these six people meet our criteria during the interviews. Headhunting is harder than it looks. Over the past two weeks, Egon and Izuku were able to interview every last person set up by Professor Cephalopod and Dr. Orping. Each person came on a different day and the interviewer changed from Izuku or Egon when one of them wasn't busy. Rarely was it to have both. And like before, Egon told Cephalopod and Orpington to take a back seat on this one, much to their dismay. The very first person they interviewed was an older Japanese woman with short black hair, a muscular yet chunky body, and a blue eye with one covered in an eye patch. Today's interviewer was Izuku who skimmed through her background and her resume. So Ms. Kape asked Cho, it says you're 40 years old. He asked as the woman nodded. I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I'm not judging you because of your age. Just curious why you would be looking for a new job. Izuku assured her, already thinking about the worst-case scenario with his question. She thought for a minute then explained, Well I felt like I needed a change of pace, and retired life just wasn't cutting it for me. It's more something to keep me busy. As I am sure you saw, I have several degrees in manufacturing, construction, and research. Izuku confirmed with a nod and glancing at her resume said, I did. So what exactly did you do for work before this? I was a decorated war veteran, Purple Heart. She told him nonchalantly, War veteran. Izuku exclaimed while nearly falling out of his seat. Cho then took out a few items from her bag and placed them in front of him. The first was a picture of her in full uniform and covered in medals. The next was a Purple Heart certificate. Izuku had to blink several times to ensure he saw this correctly. In a small voice, he said, Oh my goodness. Due to my aid in the Battle of Chris crossing by hot wiring the enemy tank and using it against them. That's where I lost my eye. I was able to bring the battle machine back, take it apart, see how it was made and draw up schematics for us to use. She spun her short tail with a nostalgic tone. That's incredible, Izuku exclaimed while pushing his hair back. He then stood up and saluted her while stating, Well ma'am allow me to say thank you for your services and you're hired. Sho stood up with a smile and saluted him back. A few days later Egon was the one to interview the next person who came. 
A tall, scruffy, and scrappy man with pink hair and golden eyes, covered in grease and oil with many tears in his clothing. In short, he did not look ready for an interview. His smile was big and proud, his excitement palpable, his eyes alert or eye, since he only had one. And the other with a small portion of his face was covered up in a mechanical replacement. Wary of him already, Egon looked through both his background check and resume. After a bit of thought he broached the topic, asking, Mr. Shishi Hatsum, it says here you handsome. Problematic behavior with your other workplace. Care to explain your side of the story? He smiled while proudly pointing a thumb at himself and explaining, Ah yes, you see I don't mean to toot my own horn but I consider myself somewhat of an out-of-the-box genius. Go on, Egon prompted him. So I like to do things and test things that others don't or won't do. So that got me into a lot of trouble. It continues. I see. Egon confirms. He then sighs while shrugging and saying, So they fired me. But whatever I did, I got results even if they did explode three or ten times. That's also how I replaced one of my eyes. Uh-huh. Egon replied while narrowing his eyes. If you are still not convinced, allow me to show you one of my inventions. He offered while taking something from inside his overalls and placing it on the table while exclaiming, Ta-da. Egon narrows his eyes as he observes aloud, a toy sci-fi gun. In front of him was what looked like a plastic ray gun with paint and stickers to make it appear appealing to children. Hatsum giggles and tells him, that's just to make it appear less threatening. Allow me to demonstrate. He then pointed the toy at a small potted plant and shot. A bean came out, grabbed the plant, and pulled it right to his hand. The only thing Egon could say was, wow, it's a tractor beam, Hatsum said in a sing-song tone before things went wrong. As soon as the plant went to him, several other random things started to shift before flying at him and attaching to his body alongside Egon who was pulled right out of his seat. From there, he was pressed front to front with Hatsum, nose to nose in a very awkward position. The two of them looked at one another for a long while before saying with a coy tone, Oh sir, I didn't know you cared. Turn. It's. Off. Egon growled at him. He flicked the off switch and all the attracted items including Egon finally fell or broke away. Egon grunts at him and Hatsum chuckles nervously while saying, it might still have a few bucks. After straightening out his lab coat and fixing his glasses, he tells the man, if we hire you then you'll have to be monitored, not of any interactions with others while working, and be placed in a highly secure room so you don't cause too much destruction. Sounds perfect to me, Hatsum answered in zeal. After brushing himself off, Egon extends his hand and says, well welcome aboard Mr. Hatsum, please don't make me regret this decision. He told him in a flat tone as Hatsum was shaking his hand excitedly. A week after that, the next newcomer came and was interviewed by Izuku. Once again with a background check and resume on hand he looked over everything she had and he liked what he saw so far. The interviewee was a young woman in her mid-twenty seconds with long straight blonde hair, green eyes, a mix of yellow and pink accessories, and glasses, and appeared to be mixed Japanese and Spanish. She seemed to be very excitable and always had a bright smile on her face the whole time. Before Izukus could say anything, the woman spoke out and told him I'm an elated tone. First of all I'd just like to thank you for giving me this opportunity, sir. Thank you for coming out here MS, Eiko Miyazaki. Izuku replied while making sure to pronounce her name correctly. She giggles and waves her hand while offering. Oh please, call me Honey Lemon. All my friends do. Well Honey Lemon, I like what I see so far. You have many degrees and credentials to go with it. Izuku complimented her as he looked over her resume. Thank you, I worked very hard to get them. Honey Lemon said back with a proud smile. I'd just like to ask. Izuku began before she suddenly cut in again. Oh, and if you're unsure about my abilities, I bought something with me to show you. Do you have anything made of metal? She asked while digging through her enormous shoulder bag. Izuku was a bit unsure but allowed curiosity to take over and he went to his cum length. Talking over he called into the facility. Can someone bring me something made of metal we don't need? He then pushed the speaker button again and stated firmly. And not a mimicuti this time, please. A few minutes later an in-process robot created by Dr. Orpington, walked in with a sheet of metal. Once it stood the solid piece up it left and Honey Lemon finally found what she was searching for. She jumped to the metal sheet and began to spray it with something that came out of a pink-colored spray bottle. After several sprays, it left a pink mist hanging all around it. From there she pulled out another device that electricity charged the air around the mist and instantly turned the metal slab pink. Ta-da! Honey Lemon proclaimed. So dot 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 pink. Izuku observed while trying not to sound unimpressed. She chuckled excitedly and said in a sing-song tone, Here's the best part. She then walked up to the pink metal and touched it with only her index finger. Right away the sheet seemed to explode in a pink cloud all around them. Some of it was dusting Izuku's face, hair, and coat. Whoa, was the only thing he could say in amazement. I know right. Chemical metal embrittlement. Honey Lemon exclaimed in zeal as she took over her pink-colored glasses and tried to brush off her pink outfit. 
Izuku quickly dusts himself off and sticking out his hand he tells her, Well, Honey Lemon, you're hired. Honey Lemon squealed in delight and began to rapidly shake Izuku's hand while half yelling. Oh thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you. Though she quickly realized how hard and rough she was shaking him and stopped while apologetically saying, Oh, I'm sorry. The next day Egon took up the next interview and was met with a man whose features were hard to pin down since several parts of him kept changing to different animals. The only constant thing was his green eyes and brown hair. Looking at his record and resume, Egon inquired, Mr. Anima Genis, it says on your resume that you were a zoologist. Why come to work here? Genis looked like he was resisting the urge to roll his eyes as he explained. My previous work had me only studying animals and their environments, behavior, and nothing else. I wanted to try and find a new way to help animals with adjusting to new environments and bolster the population not dig through rhino dung to study their diet. I thought about changing my career choices for that and here I am. I can understand your frustration. Egon sympathizes with the man before looking and thinking things over before saying, well, consider yourself hired. Two days after that both Izuku and Egon were able to collaborate on the next interview. With the information in hand, the two men say across from their next potential employee. It was a short stout woman of African descent. Her skin was colored like soil and freckles decorate her cheeks and her hair was a giant blush that was shaped like an afro. Egon was the first to start by saying, Mrs. Pamela Hollyhock, I'm a bit concerned with what I've found out about you. She raised an eyebrow as he continued and asked her, You created a literal monster Venus flytrap and it ate three people. Care to explain that? She huffed at that then answered, Well honey, back when I worked at the Tokyo Botanical Research Facility, I had told my co-workers to not come into one of the greenhouses for a while as I was working on a special self-made assignment. Took it up with the whole chain of commands and they okayed it. But a couple of yahoos tried to sneak in to steal it to take credit. And wheel, you can guess what happened after. So I had to take the blame and got canned. Izuku whistles in shock and amazement and says, Woof, what a deal breaker. I hate it when companies do nothing to protect their employees from the prospect of saving face. Hollyhock nods in reply. Izuku then goes off track and says, I can't say that those people deserved it, but if you get killed by a stationary plant, then at that point it's natural selection. He looks at Egon and he shrugs nonchalantly. Hollyhock hums and agrees, I hear you, honey. I do have one more concern to bring up. Your hair. Nothing wrong with it. It's just dot dot dot. Well I'm sure I don't have to tell you that a work environment like this has many dangers including machinery and chemicals. I wouldn't want you to get hurt. Egon attempted to tell her as nicely as he could. She smiles and with waves assures him, not to worry sweetie. I can control all plant life. With a twitch of her head and her afro sinks and morphs into long braid like veins. She then wiggles her index finger and the potted plant on Egon's desk grows so large and fast that it breaks its pot and sprouts cut white flowers. The two men watch this in awe before looking at one another in amazement. Then back to her where Egon proclaimed, Wow, well, you're hired. On the last day of the two weeks, Egon took hold of the last interview and was very confused going in. It was an interview for one, but there were three different jobs. It was one person trying to do three jobs. It made no sense and Professor Cephalopod, who set it up, was no help in explaining it just being vague with a knowing and entertained glance. When he got to his office he was even more confused when he was beset by three identical people, all females in their thirty seconds, tall, thin, blue eyes, and black hair, all wearing the same clothes and in fact, they all looked exactly like one another apart from the style of their hair. The one on the right had long hair and curls at the ends. The one in the middle had medium hair and ringlets. The one on the left had short hair that was side-swept. All three girls, upon seeing Egon, all got up and bowed deeply to him while saying in scary unison, Greetings sir. Egon was taken aback and didn't know how to reply to this, which gave the girls more than enough time to introduce themselves. I'm Morgan, said the girl with long hair. I'm Megan, said the girl with medium hair. And I'm Millicent, said the girl with short hair. Egon took note of how all their voices sounded the same and after adjusting himself to the uncomfortableness he greeted back while asking, Nice to meet you girls as well. So you're all looking to become my organizer, secretary, and receptionist respectfully, yes. He then looked down at his hands that held their resume and he observed aloud. But you only gave me one resume. Why is that? We are one person. All three answered in unison. Egon raised an eyebrow and asked, sorry, what do you mean? The three girls then closed their eyes and began to vibrate faster and faster until they became three blurry images. The three melded into one and after the vibrating stopped. There stood a beautiful woman like the three girls before. She had the same face, eyes, and everything apart from her hair which was long and straight. The woman bowed and in the same voice but with a different tone, greeted. Hello sir, my name is Morgan Layful. My quirk grants me the ability to split my body and consciousness in three ways. I've done this so many times up to the point where my other personalities do not like being in one body for too long. 
Egon blinks a few times and replies. This makes a lot more sense. After adjusting himself he tells the woman, While I understand the fact you are three people with one body, by law, I can only pay you one salary. That was to be expected. Morgan agreed with a nod. Egon looked over her resume and after a bit of thought he said, Well, I like what I see in your resume. So you're hired. Egon looked up from the paper only to see the three girls again as they spoke in unison. Thank you very much, sir. Egon had to repress the urge to freak out and instead forcefully blew out air to stay calm as he muttered, that's gonna need some getting used to. After the two weeks had ended, Egon called for all the interviewees to attend a meeting at the facility a few days later on their first official day of work. Everyone had gathered in the front entry loft where talk was abuzz in the area as everyone got to know one another. Though the talking quickly subsided when Egon and Izuku walked into the room. Everyone, everyone please gather around. Egon called as everyone present formed a circle around the two men. Egon cleared his throat and announced, As the owner and operator of the Teostra Research Laboratory, I would just like to be the first to say welcome and congratulations. It is a pleasure to have each one of you here working with us. Everyone clapped in response with some jumping for joy, whistling, or laughing. Egon put up his hand and once quite again he said, I expect to see great things and greater achievements from all of you. I hope you can make me proud. Yes sir, everyone announced in unison. Egon clapped his hands and stated, Great to hear. Now if any of you have questions or concerns regarding anything, please bring it up with me or the Vice President Dr. Mitter. He motions to the small boy beside him who looked like a frightened dog that just got yelled at for pooping inside the house. No hands went up, much to Izuku's relief. Public speaking was never a skill for him. That is until Hollyhock raised her hand. Izuku gulped and steadied himself as he called out, Yes, how exactly did you two run this place? It's huge and has been in operation for weeks. How'd you do it? She asked the two men. The two of them looked at one another before smiling as Egon answered. I'm glad you asked because I was thinking of a way to tell you all that. Before all of you, we had two others helping us. They'll be your senior co-workers, and I warned you they are a bit strange. All the people looked at him confused or like he was crazy making Egon sweat drop at seeing them not understand. Izuku tugged on his sleeve and offered, maybe it would be better if we just showed them. Izuku then went over to the front desk phone and pushed the facility speaker button. He called, Professor Cephalopod and Dr. Orpington, please come to the main foyer. After putting the phone down they were all struck with the sound of something very fast speed down the hallway and towards their direction. After finding the source they all stepped away from the hallway as they heard two voices yelling at each other, both getting closer and closer with each word. Slow down you pompous poultry. Professor Cephalopod screamed in fright. I can't. Your slimy fish bowl fried my controls. Dr. Orpington screamed back at him as she attempted to gain control over her car. We're gonna crash. The professor yelled as one of the foyer walls zoomed into view. I'm gonna die, crowed the doctor in terror. Suddenly the mechanical cart crashed into the wall at top speed with bits of parts, metal, glass, and water flying all over the place as everyone jumped out of the way, covered themselves up, or watched in a mixture of awe and horror. The last thing of all to happen in the chaos was a single wheel that rolled out from the wreckage and spun around to stop on the floor in front of them. What was that? The Morgana triplets asked in unison. Your co-workers, Egon drowned. The two animals managed to pull themselves out from the wreckage and stubble into view. Luckily it did seem like they were hurt, just dazed from the impact. Otto was the first to shake out his stupor and saw that they were being looked at by all the new employees with confusion. Adjusting himself and his translator he saw his compatriot and tried to get her back into motion. He slapped the doctor's back and stated, Put yourself to getting Penny Henny. Our new work associates are here and you're making us look bad. My brain feels like pudding. Pluck replied in a dazed tone, with swirls in her eyes, foregoing trying to help her. He turned around and after clearing his throat he introduced himself. Greetings everyone, my name is Professor Otto Cephalopod. It's a pleasure to be working together with so many intelligent minds. And the half-dead bird you see is my associate, Dr. Cluck Orpington. He motions to the chicken that was barely able to stand on its legs. Suddenly Cluck shook herself back to consciousness and exclaimed, Your associate. I think you mean, my associate. Otto rolled his eyes and shot back. Of course, you'd come out of your stupor for a comment like that. What's that supposed to mean? She yelled while getting into his face. Why don't you use that big head of yours to figure it out, chicken little? He yelled while pushing her back. She growled and yelled, my head may be big, but at least my brain is smarter than yours, Squidward. Otto then curled his tentacles in anger and proclaimed, I hate how his name and species don't correlate with one another. As the two of them continued to bicker, everyone else was staring at the two hyper-intelligent animals in a mixture of awe, wonder, and confusion, making Egon slap his face while Izuku smiled and laughed awkwardly. Talking animals, Hankayo observes aloud, Pool, Honey Lemon, Hatsum, and Genis speak in unison. 
I hope you boys didn't make any talking plants. Hollyhock asks suspiciously. Not yet. Egon tells her with a sigh, knowing the inevitable. You could be the first. Izuku jokingly offered. Sho shakes her head and states, Welp, I've officially seen it all. Hankyo places a hand on her shoulder and tells her, I get the feeling you're saying that too soon. As he told her this, Pete walked into the room, attracted to all the commotion, and began to peck mindlessly at the destroyed machine. Sho went to open her mouth but Hankyo tightened his grip, making her look at him, where he just solemnly shook his head. Sho understood and just dropped it, allowing everything to play out as it was dot 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 i in chaos. Egon looked over a large sheet of schematics on his much cleaner desk. It was a map of the whole facility with a detailed outline of all security measures on the premises. Hidden turrets, traps, sensors, Tesla gates, and much more were outlined in the promise of max security. After looking it over for quite a while he fixed his glasses to look up at the happily excited smiling face of Dr. Cho. He cleared his throat and told her in a nervous tone, While I do like the schematics you have for an in facility security system, Dr. Cho. I'm just a bit worried about how, um, how should I say this? Extreme and fatal it is. Don't you think it's a bit much? Cho raised an eyebrow as she leaned in and shot back. With what we got and are doing here, I'd say it's almost too little. This is honestly the watered-down version of what I originally thought up. Holy Christ. Egon exclaimed as he thought about the ramifications. Watching as Cho said back to glance at him with a smug look. Seeing her point he told her with a sigh. Well, I can't argue with that. I'll allow it and if need be we'll add more later on. But add some non-lethal defenses as well. Can't be all gun ho for every situation. You may commence construction on it. Dr. Cho nods and rolls up the diagrams before leaving the new automatic sliding doors made by Professor Hatsum. Once she left the doors stayed open as someone else barged in. Egon noticed this, looked up from his desk, and saw Izuku. He was red in the face, shaking like a leaf, and two seconds from crying. Egon sighed lightly to himself and said, Oh boy. Yes, Izuku. What have you done this time? I had an accident. He finally admitted through a shaky breath. I thought you were housebroken. Egon replied with a raised eyebrow. Professor. He shouted back in a mix of panic and anger. Egon placed up his hands and in a calm tone told him, I'm just teasing. What's bugging you so badly? Izuku sniffs back his emotions and steadies his voice as he answers. I was dabbling around with the evolution and quirk splinters and I made something I had no intention of making. Egon waits for the rest but when it doesn't come, he prompts him firmly. Well don't leave me in suspense. Tell me what it is. Izuku walked up to his desk on shaky legs. His emotions just moments from spilling over as fear gripped his heart at how his boss would react to his newest blunder. And so he reached into his coat and brought out a small creature cupped in his hands, showing it to the man reluctantly. Here, he said with a quiver. Egon looked down at the little creature, adjusting his glasses, seeming to be nothing but an oddly colored lizard. He chuckled at what Izuku was so scared about showing him and proclaimed, Is that it? This teeny tiny little lizard is all that you made. I was expecting something far more. He trailed off as the small lizard took a mammalian gait, sprouted a set of small wings, and breathed out a puff of smoky fire. Dangerous, he said in confusion. He looked at the boy who was begging to shake and cry while asking him calmly, Izuku dot 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 did you make a? The boy broke down into tears, hunching over and covering his face as he wailed, I didn't mean to. I didn't realize it would happen. Egon was shocked by his reaction to him and almost froze up. But luckily he kept himself together and placed the baby dragon on his desk while he tended to the terrified crying boy. Holding his shoulders and petting his head he told him, Okay okay, let's calm down for a moment. I'm not mad, just surprised. It's not like you tried to hide this from me until it got out of hand or did it behind my back and you have told me that it was a complete accident. Just give me the rundown of what happened. Why you're not mad? Izuku looked up with red eyes and a runny nose. Just surprised, that's all. Egon assures him. Izuku sniffles and gets help cleaning up his face from Egon as he explains. Well after testing and gaining the results of the quirk and evolution splinters, I thought about what would happen if both were used on the same creature. No plant I used would work so I used an animal instead, and to minimize any damage I used a small creature that was a baby. He let Izuku breathe and collect himself a bit before he continued, but after five minutes he gently prompted him, go on. So I used the fertilized egg case of a gecko, and when it hatched, this came out, and I came to you as soon as I did. He finally finished off. Egon sat back on his butt on the floor and breathed a sigh of relief, which was close enough for the baby dragon to climb onto his head down his face, over his body, and across his lap before climbing into Izuku. The little lizard crawled up to his neck and cuddled into it, observing the animal. Egon noticed how different it was from most reptiles at a second glance. Apart from the wings and mammalian gait, it had distinct claws on all four of its limbs, a head it held upright, two stubs of horns, eyes large enough to be seen from both the side and front, colored a blood orange to red, and its skin was like a mix of scales and regular skin. 
Still, it was the normal size for a newly hatched gecko. After he breathed out any stress he told Izuku in a calm tone, Okay good. I know the details. We can work on finding out more pressing things about this new species. Like how big it will grow, what it will eat, what temperament it will have, and so forth. After that, we will decide on whether to keep or kill it while it's still young and manageable. No need for that. I have just the solution. A voice called from the still open doorway. Both men looked over and together they said aloud, Professor Cephalopod, what do you mean by that? Izuku asks him. Me and Professor Genis were collaborating. He stared off. That's not good. Egon muttered under his breath and made this. He finishes while placing a strange splinter at their feet that seemed to change the brightness of itself while changing to many psychedelic colors. Egon held up the strange pulsating splinter and asked, and this is, this splinter does in days, what thousands of years of selective breeding does. The professor explained vaguely. Huh, both said at once. The professor rolls his eyes and explains further. Keep it near any wild thing and it will become as domestic as a dog in just a few days. Well, at least this solves that specific dilemma of this thing turning on us and into a meal. Izuku stated while admitting the splinter's strange colors. As the two men were looking at the psychedelic splinter, Otto tried to make his escape, only for Egon to catch wind of something and shout, Hold it right there, calamari boy. Before he could scramble, Egon grabbed the octopus under his eyes and brought him face to face where he stated, What else? What do you mean? Otto asked back innocently. Egon squeezed him tighter and exclaimed, Don't what do I mean me? My IQ may not be half as high as yours, but I wasn't born yesterday. What else did you and Professor Jenis make while collaborating? Giving a nervous laugh and rubbing the back of his head he admitted, Ah, yes, about that. I was going to come to you about something else. What? Egon growled while squeezing him again. After a moment of contemplation, Cephalopod tells him, You're gonna have to change Gamma's feeding regimen. Why? To what? Izuku was the one to inquire, being the main caretaker. An adult amount. Cephalopod tells him while trying to look away and sweating. Izuku looks at him weirdly and Egon adjusts his grip so the two could speak face to face as Izuku asks further, She's a baby. She won't be an adult for another decade or so. About that. Cephalopod laughs nervously. Egon squeezed him again and snarled. About what? After tapping his tentacles he tried to say, Well, before he could answer fully, a loud sound, like a trump being amplified through a jet engine, sounded through the now closed door. Both men looked at one another when the sound stopped and ran out the automatic door, cephalopod still in Egon's hand. As they ran, the loud sound rang out once more and they were able to follow it right to the front entry foyer where they saw something that made their jaws drop. Standing in front of them and eating the decorative plants, while Dr. Jenis tried to get a hold of it, was a fully grown woolly mammoth. Meanwhile, Megan, who was manning the desk, looked unfazed at the enormous prehistoric creature eating everything around her. After letting the shock and the amazement pass them, Egon asked rhetorically, Professor Cephalopod, why is our baby mammoth calf now a full-grown adult mammoth cow? Me and Professor Jenis have made several different splinters for population surging, one of which causes any organism to rapidly develop. The professor admitted, only to be squeezed again as he asked in a repressed angry tone, and you tried to hide this from me, why? We needed to run more tests, Otto explained while sweating before he tried to save himself by offering. On the plus side, we made sure to spay her before doing so. Egon gave him a half-lidded look as Izuku informed him, You know that only works on boys, right? Making the professor turn pale. Egon looked ready to burst a gasket and even the now fully grown Gamoth could sense it and started to walk away. Izuku stepped back with the baby dragon hiding in his hair, and Jenna started to hide behind the desk as Megan tried to make herself look busy. But no furry came and he calmed himself down with an irritated sigh as he stated calmly, Izuku, you are no longer solely responsible for the care of Gamoth. From now on Professors Cephalopod and Genis will help as well. Understood. Why yes sir. The octopus and man replied quickly in unison. After placing the octopus on the ground and fixing his hair and glasses, he turned back to the facility and said, Come along Izuku, let's run some tests and diagnostics on a new fire-breathing friend. With that Izuku filled after him to a testing chamber to run tests on the new animal, leaving Cephalopod and Genis to try and round up Gamoth back into her enclosure. Truly the first of many strange days to come. One day at the Neo Icon Phoenix Research Facility, the front entry phone rang for the first time in its entire time of opening. It only rang once before quickly being picked up. Hello and thank you for calling. This is the front desk of Neo Icon Phoenix Research Facility. This is Megan speaking. How may I assist you today? She asked while flipping her hair out of the way for her ear. Some talking was heard from the other end and Megan replied, Uh-huh. After a bit more talk, Megan said, One moment sir, I'll transfer you. She pressed a few buttons and told her other half what was happening and she answered, Hello and thank you for calling. This is Millicent the head secretary. How may I assist you? She answers as the voice speaks and she replies, Uh-huh. 
A bit more talk and Millicent says, One moment sir, I'll see if he's in his office. She put the person on hold and punched into Egon's office phone. After a few rings the receiver was picked up. Yes, Millicent? Egon answers, Sir there's a man on the other line looking for you. Goes by the name of Nezu, claiming to be the principal of UA. She informed him. Struck with confusion as well as concern he quickly decides and tells her, punch him through. Hanging up on him she punches back Nezu on the other end and says, Hello, sir. Nezu replies and she tells him, Yes he's in the office and able to speak. I'll put you right through. Nezu says a few things and Millicent says, Have a nice day sir. Millicent transfers him over to Egon. His phone rings and he picks it up while answering. Hello, Professor Egon Cristallo. Nezu's voice says on the other end. Egon could tell he was the real deal from the many interviews he's heard his voice over TV. He breathes and answers, speaking. This is Nezu, principal of UA. I hope I'm not intruding on anything. He introduced him with an apologetic tone. Waving off the phone he replies, No no, not at all. What can I do for you? There is a bit of silence and Nezu finally tells him with some hesitation in his tone. You see, I've heard quite a bit about you and your facilities. Egon raised an eyebrow as he leaned forward and asked, Really? Man, we haven't even brought out the big stuff yet or gone public and we already have a whisper of a reputation. I hope it's good. Nezu nods silently on the other end and he answers, Yes yes, all good things. The thing is I'm in a bit of a pickle. Go on. Egon prompted him, feeling his caution rise again. Nezu clears his throat and explains, Here at UA, we have something called the Unforeseen Simulation Joint or USJ for short, and I'm sure you remember that awful typhoon that swept by here recently. Egon blows out the air between his lips and complains, how could I not? That storm knocked down every tree we had just planted. I'm sorry to hear about your trees, but the USJ got the worst of it and requires massive repairs. Nezu continues, more than confused by this point, Egon gets straight to the point and states, I'm not sure I understand where you're getting at. In short, we use that place to teach our students rescue work. Unfortunately, we can't now. But I recently heard about your facility and had an idea. He told him as Egon raised an eyebrow in suspicion and intrigue. Would you be so kind as to allow our first years to practice in your facility? Nezu asked with as much sincerity as he could muster over the phone. This shocked the man and with a flabbergasted tone he told him. Though I love nothing more than helping the youth, I also must tell you we aren't half as big or prepared for handling the education of rescue work. I completely understand that which is why I have something else in mind. A treasure hunt if you will. Nezu explained, making Egon more curious as he continued. The students go around and collect clues on villain activities, find out what's what, and reach the goal. Like detective work, Egon becomes intrigued with the idea and says, That sounds far more realistic for us. And I was also hoping to turn it into a field trip for our students, teach them about the wider world of science and everything it goes into their daily lives. I'm more than capable of realizing that our youth is so romanticized by heroes that they have no respect or idea about what goes on behind the scenes with the creation of suits and gear and such. Nezu explained and asked him. Egon thought it over for a moment before saying in agreement. That sounds like a great idea. Oh, but I'll need a list of students attending so I can make proper arrangements. Of course, please give me a moment and... There, it should have gone through. Nezu says as the sound of typing can be heard. Egon sees an email get sent over and he wonders how Nezu got it, let alone the number for his facility. That's something he'll have to find out later as he replies, I see it. Now let's see. He looks over the long list containing 40 students, 20 in total from two classes. As he looks over the list he sees a certain name that sticks out. After shaking his head and scrolling back up he exclaimed, Oh, is something wrong? Nezu asked, Huh, Egon said in a stupor, realizing he and Nezu were still talking. He then replied in a shaken tone, Oh nothing is wrong, I just, could I call you back later? I have to check up with my second in command. Nezu is quiet but eventually says back, Of course, take all the time you need. If I don't hear from you by the end of the week I'll assume it's a no. Egon repressed the urge to sigh in relief and said before hanging up, Thank you Principal Nezu, have a nice day. He slams the phone down, huffs a sigh, leans back with his hand in his face, and quickly stands up. He leaves his office and after getting into the hallway he says to himself in stress, Boy oh boy, Izuku is going to freak out when he hears this. It only took him a few minutes to get to Izuku's office though he wished it was a long walk since he had no idea how to go about breaching this subject. He was feeling more stressed than when he asked the most popular girl in school to dance and got rejected. He made it to the door breathed deeply, pushed back his hair, and allowed the automatic to open as he knocked on the meadow while poking his head in. Izuku, are you busy? He asked while looking around. There he saw Izuku sitting at his desk with the computer up and the video camera on with the mic already plugged in. He turned around and quickly replied, No professor, I'm not. I was about to give my addendum on what's been going on with the laboratory, Gamoth, all the new splinters and discoveries, and even a little torch wick here. 
but that can wait. There's something I have to tell you. He told the boy while walking as he rubbed the back of his head. What is it? Izuku inquired, feeling curious and a bit worried. Egon breathed deeply with stress while pulling his fingers under his chin and told him, Okay, you know what? I'm not gonna beat around the bush. I'll just tell you straight up. This makes Izuku more nervous as the man explained. So the principal of UA called just earlier asking to use the lab for some kind of hero exercise or something. I don't know. And he sent me a list of students' names to see how many would attend. And will dot 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 this name stood out most of all. Egon opened up his phone to the email that was sent to him and reluctantly handed it over to Izuku. Izuku was more than confused as he took the device and looked over the list of many different names. Names he didn't recognize in the slightest, except for Yuraka. That is until his eyes fell upon the name that Egon dreaded to show him. He had to double back to make sure and when he did he freaked out. Kakin. Izuku screamed in shock. Yeah. Egon admitted uncomfortably while rubbing his head. Izuku's head dropped, his face overcast, his shoulders shook, and his hands trembled as tears threatened to spill out. But even so, he managed to say, I should have known. He's always been amazing at everything. Always. I didn't tell him yes or anything like that yet. I just told him to wait. Egon quickly assured him while waving his hands rapidly. He then took a breath, kneeled to his level, placed a hand on his shoulder, and offered, Izuku if you are not comfortable with this, I can call him right now and tell him it's off. He won't mind. Izuku wipes away the tears and replies with a quiver in his tone, No no dot 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 it's okay. Really, it'll be fine so long as we don't see each other. I'll just stay in my office the whole day. That won't be hard. Egon relented but told him, if you say so. But just to be safe I'll have a guard at your door and have him be monitored. If anything happens, I'll stop him. Thank you. I appreciate it. Really? Izuku replied while looking away. Egon then wrapped him in a hug and squeezed him tightly. He told him, of course. Anything from my favorite person in the whole world. Izuku hugged him back and Egon told him before leaving, I hope this goes well. Egon then got up, walked back through the door L, and left to make his return call to the principal, leaving Izuku behind in his office to turn back to the computer set up and give his addendum. Breathing deeply he centered himself before turning on the record button and starting his report. This is Dr. Izuku Midoriya reporting once again to give an update on the goings-on here at the Neo Icon Phoenix Research Facility. Well it's less of an experimental log and more of an update report. I haven't been able to do many experiments and what I do have is in the planning stage. I did make one thing, hit I'll get to that later. Okay, I'm rambling now so I'll just get straight into it. We have been able to hire several new employees here at the facility to help with other avenues of research, all of which are heads of their divisions. Theirs is Dr. Hankai Osuru, the head of the Sound Division, Professor Kapeash Cho, the head of the Defense and Armaments Division, Professor Shishi Hatsumel, the head of the Robotics and Machine Division, Dr. Pamela Hollyhock, the head of the Botanical Division, Professor Anima Genis, the head of the Creature Division, Professor Eiko Miyazaki. Or as she likes to be called, Honey Lemon is the head of the chemical division. And finally, the Morgana triplets aren't doctors or professors but instead act as much needed help for Professor Ego. We have a lot of bases covered and I'm glad for that. It's only been a week and much has been done already. For instance, Professor Hatsum has already decked out the entire facility with state-of-the-art devices such as automatic doors, finger and eye scanners, a speedier internet and network. He's even starting construction on a unit of different robots. They're there for things like defense, cleaning, tours, and so much more, mostly for the grunt work that would take up too much time. I even heard a rumor that Professor Cho was going to outfit the facility with military-grade defense weapons and other such things, which we will need in the long run. Dr. Hollyhock is having a field day in the greenhouses. She's made so much stuff I can recall it all at once. Honey Lemon is having a great time without any restrictions on materials and has made planes and lots of discoveries that she couldn't before. Unlike Hatsum, who had blown up a time or ten, she has things set in place and dots all her arm to make sure nothing unexpected happens or at least attempts to mitigate the damage. The triplets have cut Professor Egon's work by three quarters so I'm sure he'll finally be able to start work on experiment. And finally is Dr. Hankayo who has had the most success thus far. He's managed to turn one of the splinter's frequencies into a baseline and that's from both the positive and negative charges. We're not sure what a baseline frequency does but we'll find out. He's also discovered that any splinter's frequency can be altered with the air of sound waves. He can turn a positive into a negative and vice versa, which brought up the topics of the main vein. He and I have crossed minds and theorized that when the singularity soul was subject to tectonic movements the frequency it produced also changed, affecting both evolution on Earth as well as the first quirks. But it's unlikely that such a small fragment could affect a whole planet, so their plan of going to the same dig site to see if we can retrieve more. Speaking of collaborations between divisions, Professor Cephalopod and Genis have done the same. 
and quite a lot that they initially tried to hide from Professor Ego. He was not happy about that. I swear I just about saw him breathe fire. Anyway, like I said they've done a lot. First off they somehow managed to make splinters that do some of the craziest things I've seen. The goal is to help with the decline of and near extinction of animals. Instead of making splinters that copy DNA or some kind of present gas or liquid, they were able to create them by the use of mixing several kinds of quirks and exposing them to the vibration therapy from Dr. Hankai, though most are still in testing. As for what they have the list is as followed. The little lady splinter, this one can cause any female creature with a working set of reproductive organs to become pregnant with a biological clone of herself. The rough and rowdy splinter, this one can cause any creature, male or female, to go into its natural mating cycle even if it isn't the time of year. The calm and cool splinter, this one can cause any creature to instantly become acclimated to any new environments it's put in and show no signs of stress. This allows animals like rhinos and pandas to more easily mate. Growth spurt, this one increases the potency of the singularity soul's natural ability to cause minor organisms to rapidly age thus causing animals that could take years or even decades to fully mature to do so overnight. This one has been tested, unfortunately, it wasn't smartly used on the right subject. And now Gamoth is a full-grown adult, and all before I found anything specific about her ancient diet. The good boy, this one causes any animal that is not already domesticated to become as willing and sociable as a dog, once again, used in Gamoth and one other. The scrambled mixer, this one brushes away the problem of inbreeding in the case of one or two individuals left in a species. When in proximity, the subject's DNA will become completely scrambled to the point they are biologically unrelated, thus allowing siblings and parents to mate in times of crisis. Note, I didn't name any of these splinters. All this talk of animals brings me to my next bit of news to share. In the little time, I did have when not worrying about other things, I was able to do some testing with both the evolution splinter and quirk splinter. I had wondered what would happen when both were exposed at the same time. So I started my experiments with plants as they would most easily get under control. However, that didn't work as no matter what plant I tried in any state of development or any kind would simply die. I guess the radiation was too much, so I decided to use an animal. And for safety, I used the smallest one I could that could handle both radiations simultaneously and a baby. After acquiring the gecko egg, I placed it in the incubator and kept both splinters close. About five days later and it hatched into something I didn't expect in the least. In short, it became a dragon. I was scared shitless at the thought of what Egon would say or act about this, but I knew that hiding it would be worse. So on the verge of tears and a breakdown I reluctantly showed him and to my surprise, he was only just that, surprised. I guess I was overthinking it all, but my previous experiences with stuff like this way otherwise. Then again, I did take a lot of unnecessary risks which is why he acted that way so many times. And I didn't hide it from him, just went straight to him once I realized what it was. Sorry, I'm rambling again. Anyhow, after using the good boy splinter on it, we now have no issues with the dragon making a meal for us when it's older. He is so friendly now, but he was always like that with me. I guess he imprinted on me. On a side note, we've decided to call him Torchwick and we're not sure if he's a he at all. Speaking of Torchwick, we ran some tests to see what was what about him. There's a lot to cover, but the main thing we focused on was his rate of growth, and it is fast. It's only been about two days since his birth and he's already gone from the size of a gecko to a large parrot. It is strange even as he sits on my shoulder as I record this. Note, he ate several of the new animals with quirks including the budgie that had the sound mimic quirk, the hypnotic peacock, and the glowing pigeon. Luckily the shimmering koi fish, hydrokinetic axolotl, giant salamander, and Pete were all spared. Torchwick also learned pretty quickly not to mess with Professor Cephalopod and Dr. Orphington when they slapped and nearly pecked him to death. On a different note, I found out why the experimental newt exploded during its quirk awakening. It performed some kind of self-destructive asexual reproduction. When exposed to enough stress I, the radiation from the splinter, it exploded and from its body expelled hundreds of tiny eggs that all grew into full-grown newts with the same quirk. Now we have dozens of these things and have to walk on eggshells to make sure they don't cause a chain reaction of birthing. Knowing this Professor Cephalopod and Genis wanted to recreate the quirk in their animal population project. But that idea was quickly shut down and forbidden by Professor Egon who said it was far too cruel. And I agree. Note, keep Torchwick away from the newts. And now the final point I must bring up comes from just earlier today dot 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 just before I started this new recording. Egon told me that UA wants to come here for reasons and then he showed me a list of all the students attending and amongst them. Amongst them was K. Kaken. I won't lie, I thought my heart would stop at seeing that name. I didn't expect it, but I really shouldn't be surprised. Kaken was always amazing. He always wanted to be a hero and shoot for UA. I guess he did dot 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 I in the end. 
I, I thought I was over all of it dot 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 all of it, wanting to be a hero and everything about Kakan. But after seeing his name dot 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 it all just came back to me. The anger, the jealousy, the hate, the desire dot 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 the sadness. I thought I was better or at least numb dot 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 but I guess I never was. I'm, I'm scared of what could happen to me dot 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 if I see him. I don't want that to happen. I never want to see him again. Ever. As it may be too late to tell Egon to take it all back. Maybe. But it's only for one day and I don't have to interact with him. I can through this. Right. After all, it's not like All Might would be joining as well. That would just open a whole new can of worms. Report.